Welcome, oh, this is loud. Welcome everyone, welcome everyone. Slowly people are joining us, welcome. We are very happy to be hosting this session at the World Circular Economy Forum, Unlocking Finance for a Circular and Regenerative Economy. I am Electra, and this is my colleague Marvin. Hi. And uh, we are a Circle Economy, uh, an impact organization, global organization based in Amsterdam. We are working with businesses, cities, and nations, helping them to implement the circular economy on the ground. Our mission is to create a circular world where both people and planet can thrive. So, Marvin, tell us, what are we going to be doing today? Yes, welcome for me too. So, um, actually, today we are going to have some conversations with key experts from the world of finance. And uh, we also will learn from some practical examples how that actually looks in reality. Because we want you to understand what role finance can play and should play in the circular transition. Actually, we have four themes today, and you can see them on this tiny screen behind me. <laughs> uh, the, the first is what I just said. We really want to look at why financing is a key enabler to unlock the circular economy. Then second, we want to learn how roadmaps can actually enable action. Um, third, we look at some examples of action. How does the reality on the ground look like? And then in the end, we will um, ask the question, who actually needs to lead the change? And with that, um, I hand over to Electra again. Yes, and we can actually kick off the first session with uh, Nicola Pochettino. I want to invite Nicola, the Director of Environment and Natural Resources from the European Investment Bank. Nicola will help us understand how financing is actually one of the important enablers for the circular transition. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you. The Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the circular economy holds uh, an immense promise for a sustainable, secure, and resilient economic growth. And finance is a critical driver in this transition. Circular economy projects use a variety of strategies to preserve the materials, the energy, and the labor invested in products. Uh, from recycling to redesigning processes to reuse, remanufacture, or repair products. Circular solutions can be implemented in any sector. While a key goal of the circular economy is to have a positive impact on climate and the environment, it is also crucial for resilience and economic security. Growing global competition for natural resources, as well as security of supply concerns, have contributed to marked increase in price levels and volatility. Circular economy strategies could then also result in considerable cost savings, increasing the competitiveness of industrial systems while delivering net benefits in terms of job opportunities. Let me share our experience. Albeit still small in relative terms, EIB lending to circular economy projects has consistently increased over the past years, amounting to 3.4 billion euros uh, over the past five years, with a record level of 1.1 billion in 2022 alone. Among others, our financing has been directed to recycling aviation-grade scrap titanium, making new fabric from old clothes, reducing use of primary raw materials and waste associated in the production of electricity cables, promoting circular solution for plastics to move away from fossil sources, manufacturing masonry blocks that consume carbon dioxide gathered from industrial processes, investing in equity funds devoted to circular bioeconomy, turning recycled wood into furniture, reusing water, and developing software and hardware to help produce food waste. And beyond lending, our expertise allows us to provide technical and financial advice to project promoters. Take, for instance, the Circular City Center. This is a competence hub within the EIB to support the circular economy transition of cities and region. As you know, cities are credos and catalysts of the circular economy. My colleagues will talk about it in the accelerator sessions in a couple of days. But still, circular economy is a relatively new solution. 
that ultimately attracts less funding than other approaches. Alongside the gen general lack of awareness, uh, we observe that several investment barriers hinder the widespread adoption of circular economy. Let alone considerations of regulatory framework uh, that could be either enabler or impediments. The key barriers include limited access to capital, uncertain returns on investment, and absence of international standards. In many cases, the current economic system does not adequately reward circular solutions. Traditional linear models often prioritize short-term profits over long-term sustainability. In some countries, companies see the mountain of recycled materials but cannot sell it because the price uh, they have to charge would still be higher than that of virgin material. Without appropriate regulatory framework, such as minimum shares of recycled material for new constructions, for instance, businesses may be reluctant to invest. Financial returns are especially uncertain um, as it takes time for the benefit to materialize. Also, circular economy approaches often require changes in consumer behavior. And this leads to a limited market demand for circular products and services, which also deters investment. Limited understanding of uh, circular economy principles and practices can impede investment as well. Many projects, particularly those originated by smaller scale ventures or startups, face challenges in accessing financing or attracting investors. And investors may be hesitant to support projects that they do not fully comprehend. And business may also struggle to find the necessary expertise to design and implement circular economy strategies. Also, due to the fragmented market structure, implementing circular economy solutions often requires collaboration and coordination across different stakeholders within complex value chains. To support the circular economy transition, it is imperative that the most impactful projects can be identified swiftly and funded accordingly. To date, attempts to develop indicators Taxonomy, frameworks, and tools for assessing circularity have been pushed independently in different regions, and this has resulted in lack of transferability. Standardization is key. Now, to overcome these barriers and drive the transition to a global circular economy at the speed and scale necessary, transnational cooperation and significant targeted investments are fundamental. And that's where the international financial institutions play a role. Uh, the European Investment Bank, together with African Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank met today and confirmed their commitment to collaborate on key challenges of the circular economy, including through the Circularity Exchange Network, a group initiated by Circular Economy and the Dutch Minister of Infrastructure and Water Management that also has among its member the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, UNEPFI, and the World Economic Forum. The MDBs have identified some areas for further cooperation. First, uh, we have to improve and align definitions and metrics. That would be our first step. We need to link circularity to key climate and environmental objectives, to economic growth, resilience, and jobs. We need to build and strengthen our capacity, both internally, but also externally, together with project partners. And last but not least, develop the financial instrument that help de-risk the investment. Now, following this morning's meeting with my colleagues from the other organizations, I am glad to confirm that the MDBs will continue the work jointly, as well as with private sector and national agencies, to broaden the role of circular economy into their activities. Together, we can leverage finance and knowledge to accelerate the transition and contribute to a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. It was really helpful to understand the, the barriers, the way you map the barriers currently, but also very encouraging to see that there is a, a serious collaboration between the key financial institutions right now. Very encouraging to see that there is work going forward. Marvin, which is our next um, uh, guest? Yes, we're actually moving now to the second section, and that is how we move from ideas to action. 
And uh, I mean, it was great to learn and hear how the MDBs are collaborating, but this was actually also inspired by the work we did in the Netherlands with a Dutch uh, roadmap for the financial sector. And to talk a bit about this, I would like to invite uh, Marike Spijkerboer on stage, the Director of Sustainable Environment and Circular Economy at the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Hi, Marike. Kitos. Take a seat, please. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So, welcome. And uh, first of all, maybe you can just sketch a bit. So what is actually the, the ambitions of the Netherlands when it comes to the circular economy? Well, the Netherlands has high ambitions about the circular economy, being one of the very first countries that have ambitious circular targets uh, to be fully circular in uh, 2050, uh, reduce resource impact by 50% in 2030, and therefore we have close collaboration on all governmental levels. And this year we updated our national plan and uh, it includes more specific measures and targets for specific sectors and product groups. And that's very important to have focus on of, uh, some product groups. And we are strengthening the link between climate and circular policies. Um, and recently we agreed uh, additional climate measures in, and it includes initiatives, initiatives in the field of plastics, waste, and circular uh, innovation and real estate. So we have a lot going on. A lot going on indeed, yeah. I mean, the Netherlands are known, of course, also to really spearheading the development. And I think it's great to see that the circular economy is also really seen as a measure to reach CO2 targets, for example. Um, so, but I'm wondering, how do you actually work with the financial sector then? Well, um, there are some uh, key barriers uh, to circular fi finance, financing, we know, uh, because innovative uh, businesses uh, struggle to get financed. And it's very important we join together and we are uh, uh, specifically looking at the risk models uh, banks are using, because banks are... Uh, 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 always uh, mainly look for short-term payback and uh, look at the past and not the future. For example, the financial sector is not taking into account that some resources are ending. And um, the financial sector has been uh, uh, crucial to uh, join them and to, to, to together uh, overcome these barriers. And we started a specific uh, leading group on circular finance um, and we discussed about uh, wh what do we have to do. And uh, then we had uh, an agenda, the roadmap, the national roadmap for taking steps uh, forward to um, make the circular business model the, the, the normal model to, to use. Yeah, this group actually in Dutch, Kopgroep Circular Financieren. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 that way. you don't have to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's great because they really use also the roadmap as a, as a kind of a guidance how to, to um, move forward. Can you maybe tell us a bit more about that, uh, that roadmap? Yes, and in the, the Kopgroep, uh, <laughs> the, lead, the leading group, there are uh, uh, a lot of banks uh, joined, Dutch banks and also smaller investors, but it's um, uh, InvestNL uh, who was uh, taking the lead. And in the roadmap, we launched four themes, four main themes. Uh, firstly, to understand the risks. What risks uh, do we have to uh, see in a circular business model? Uh, align the metrics as well, because if you know what to... Uh, uh, if you know the indicators, that's uh, also very important in the financial models. Uh, learning from deals in practice, because it's also uh, good to see what is going on in practice. And we develop new instruments. Uh, that are the four main themes we use in the roadmap. Um, and, well, uh, collaboration is the, the key uh, word in it, because we, we only can do this together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also that um, 
the, the group also launched a new risk model and they are working on some very tangible outcomes there. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's, it's great work um, the, to have also these themes as a guideline. Um, then maybe just as a final question. So, because of course we want to kind of replicate also what has been done to drive um, comparable um, initiatives forward in other countries. Can you maybe give us some, some key takeaways, some learnings that um, other financial sectors in other countries could um, learn from? Well, it's very important to take action and be ambitious and set a point where you want to work to. So a roadmap is very, um, well, uh, handy then. Um, but also make sure the roadmap offers solutions for specific problems financials face. Um, and, um, well, the network we have for the roadmap, that's very important. Um, so the collaboration is the, the key uh, keyword to make it happen. Yes, great collaboration. I mean, the roadmap really also helps to bring together different stakeholders, and I think that's, that's really key. Thank you so much, Marike. That's, uh, that's it already from your side. Thanks yeah. for uh, giving us the, the perspective on the, on the Netherlands. And um, yeah, I think we're then moving to the next session. Electra? Yes. Thank you, Marike. Thank you for being here. Great to hear from uh, the ground. Great to hear the work that happens in the Netherlands. And I stay with uh, what Marike shared, that how important it is to, to put a goal, you know, to, to say we want to go there, an ambitious target. And we see how this has worked a lot in the Netherlands to create Accelerate Action. And then collaboration, we hear that. So um, I'm happy to, to move and hear more, uh, more work from the ground. And this time I would like to invite, uh, we are going to dive deeper into the idea of roadmaps and uh, how they have been applied around the world to create action. And with this, I would like to invite on stage uh, Karen Isaacson, the Managing Director of the Nordic Development Fund, come Karen, and Anthony Nion. Anthony is the Director of Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. Please give me, uh, help me to, inc to invite, to introduce them, to welcome them. Welcome. Yeah. Great to have you, welcome both. And, uh, let me start uh, with Karen, Anthony. Um, Karen, you have decades of experience in development financing, and uh, you have decided uh, actually to collaborate with the African Development Bank. Maybe you want to share with us uh, what is uh, your what you have in mind when prioritizing Africa as a region, and what does what is the role of circular economy there? Thank you very much. So uh, I will start with a little bit of context on the Nordic Development Go Fund, ahead, yeah. uh, which is the joint Nordic Climate Fund owned by the five Nordic countries and focusing then on the nexus between climate and development. So having said that, it's quite natural that uh, we focus very much on Africa and we already now have uh, over 50% of our portfolio in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. We uh, uh, invest and finance both mitigation and adaptation projects and we have the great advantage that we are a concessionary financier so we can provide both loans, grants and equity. So with this uh, focus, uh, one of the areas we have identified, which is also something where the Nordic countries has quite a lot of experience, is circular economy. And uh, in order to then drive the agenda on circular economy in the African countries, we, together with the, the government of Finland, has contributed with grant funding to a trust fund that is then managed by the African Development Bank. Um, then, uh, of course, you can learn from more developed countries in how to approach circular economy. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's important to reflect on our own achievements in this part of the world, and I'm talking in particular about uh, the, uh, the, the Nordics and the global north. And on a global level, we're not doing that great when it comes to circularity. We are only reusing approximately 10% of what we use. So, well, you can look at this. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? There, there is a great opportunity then in reducing emissions if we reuse, repurpose and recycle more. 
And of course, uh, here we are over consuming. You can just open the doors of your closet and what you have. Uh, the African countries, they are not the ones that are guilty of overconsumption. But there is also a need for African countries to look into the opportunities with a growing population. There will be more demand for different kinds of raw materials. So coming up with models also in the African continent to recycle is very important. Maybe one thing that uh, uh, is also particularly interesting for African economies is the opportunities to create jobs within circular economy. Uh, and it's true what has said, been said before, to get out of poverty, one of the most important things is to have a job. So by then supporting, as we do together with the African Development Bank, the creation of bankable business models, mm -hmm. uh, revenue generating business models, and thereby creating jobs is something that we hope to achieve in this cooperation. Great, great, very nice to hear, very nice to hear your vision. Anthony, now maybe we hear from you with your role as a director of climate change and green growth. You are also supporting the creation of uh, roadmaps. Um, why why you consider roadmaps important and as a key tool for uh, why do you use them as a central tool for uh, within your agenda? Yeah, thank you very much, Electra. Uh, let me start by saying that for us, the circular economy agenda is not optional. Mm -hmm. We are a continent of developing countries, and we believe it is right to do it right the first time than to want to retrofit later. And so for us, uh, the model we are adopting now of produce, use, discard is really not helpful. And so we think it is important. Now everyone keeps talking about Africa being the, uh, the, the, the place that you can still go for raw materials and scoop the raw materials and do things. That's changing a lot. Uh, it shouldn't be so. We should be able to preserve, conserve the use of our uh, resources. And so having seen that, we realize it is important that we don't let the drive towards circular economy to be ad hoc. Mm -hmm. You pick what you want, do whatever you think mm. addresses your issue. There should be a long-term strategy. Mm. Circular economy is about now into the future. And without a roadmap, it's difficult to know where that future is taking you to. You end up in any destination you want without that roadmap. So for us, the roadmap is important, not just in giving milestones, but in identifying the sort of policies, national and international policies, that will need to be developed to allow that circular economy mm -hmm. initiative to take place. So it's important for us. It's important also that it gives you a vision. Mm. You know exactly where you're walking, where you're going to. The process is very important because it brings together key stakeholders like we just heard. Mm -hmm. It's not something one ministry, one department, one government agency sits down to. This a whole of economy initiative. So just having that roadmap tells us that, look, We've brought together uh, elements of the society, key stakeholders together. And so having said that, uh, we are privileged to be you know, supporting five countries, for instance, in developing their uh, roadmaps with support from the Africa Circular Economy Facility. Mm -hmm. that was put together with contributions from the Nordic Development Funds and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, uh, of Finland. And so we're supporting five of those countries to develop that. And that helps us to have a common framework as to what... It doesn't have to be the same thing, but it mm -hmm. gives you a common framework. It allows us to begin to think about the metrics, you know, the... the because if you can't measure it, you don't know where it is, then it's going to be difficult to finance that. So having uh, said that, we 
had those countries were supporting mm. and we're waiting to see how what comes out of it. It's a learning process. Some countries already have that. For instance, Rwanda has a long term a roadmap mm -hmm. and Nigeria also has, but they they come up in different ways. In Rwanda, it led first to the banning of single-use plastics, mm. and for Nigeria, it's an uh, end-user buyback policy or something. So people have different focuses, but importantly, it allows us to know where we are heading to and what we need to do to get to that point. Yeah, thank you. Very, very good to understand how you, 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 you see it as a frame to bring people together, have a clear vision, but also like that you connect uh, the different processes and to create more of a uniform understanding and all the standards. Okay. Um, maybe I go to a question for both of you now and uh, we can start with Karen if you like. Uh, some more, uh, um, if you can provide us with some more practical examples of how these roadmaps are taken into action and um, what has been actually the role of the financial sector for all of us here just to more grasp how does this work? Yeah? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, I will actually pick up where uh, Anthony also uh, uh, said a few words about uh, the uh, building of institutions and building of roadmaps and uh, uh, then conclude that if we're going to, and if, if, we're, if maybe it's not the right word, to be able to save the uh, immense challenges with, uh, with both mitigation and adaptation within climate uh, change, we need to work together. That has been said before. It is absolutely important that both the public and the private sector that join forces. The role of the public sector and uh, the role of public financier is very much to create the enabling environment, to create the right prerequisites for projects, either publicly financed project or, pri or privately financed project to take off the ground. So that's one absolutely important uh, uh, part that has to be in place. But uh, it's also immensely important that we have the right business models if we then think about how to involve the private sector. Uh, and for the circular economy, this is also something that is still in the making. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there is no well-known concept uh, on how to uh, finance circular economy ventures. I have sometimes in the past when I've been speaking, I make the, I compare with where we were maybe 10, 15 years ago when we started to finance uh, off-grid energy. Yep. Uh, not many people knew what was an IPP. Now everyone knows what is an IPP and how you can finance an IPP because you can actually have a positive cash flow from the investment as such. And it's well understood and it can be repeated and private investors can then also provide the financing for these kind of ventures. So uh, this is a challenge and we're not there yet, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are examples and I would like to to then share with you uh, one experience that we have from uh, financing an equity fund. Mm -hmm. It's called the Emerging Market Climate Action Fund. It's co-managed between the EIB and Allianz, which is a big investment bank. Uh, the interesting thing about this fund, there are many in interesting things, but one interesting thing is it, that it brings together different investors with different risk return profiles, and I hope that makes sense when I say this. So uh, investors like the Nordic Development Fund, uh, we expect a return, but we are also very willing to take a high risk, has been able then to crowd in truly institutional investors, and one of them being a Swedish insurance company. So in this structure, we have one third of the high risk uh, investors and uh, two-thirds of the less uh, mm. risky investors. One of the first investments they have done is a cool chain for food 
-hmm. in Nairobi, mm -hmm. uh, which I think qualifies for circular economy that yeah. will then help the food to be preserved and, uh, uh, and avoid food waste. waste. So bringing together investors with different risk return requirements, investing in something that is, has a positive cash flow, but is still considered to be high risk. So that's one example of bringing together different stakeholders and working together to find solutions for circular economy ventures. Thank you, very clear. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Anthony, <laughs> we have a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you. Anthony, uh, maybe from your side, can you also help us with bringing some more practical examples of how the roadmaps are uh, taken into action or how, how has been the role of finance in this process? Yeah, like I said, the roadmaps are work in progress mm. and we're learning from them as we go. But investing in circular economy did not start with the coinage of the word circular economy. We've done quite many things that now pass for circular economy, whether it is in agriculture, whether it's in land restoration, mm -hmm. uh, water practice, you know, and, and so on. We've done quite a lot of that. And uh, for the finance, some of the things we've seen come up generally is the issue of the risk. For my continent, the perceived risk is just of, out through the roof. But the real risk is really not as much, if any. And so we've put together the risking tools to allow uh, those who are scared of coming to the continent to invest to do it. We, have, we provide partial risk guarantees, partial credit guarantees. And then recently, the UK government said, look, I don't know what people are talking about risk in Africa. We're going to set up a guarantee fund for you, $2 billion. If anybody defaults, take from it. That shows the confidence that they have. And I'm actually hoping that many more countries would actually see that it is there. And so for us at the African Development Bank, we've seen that we're not just a wallet. We're a financial institution where we're not just out there to write checks. We have capacity. We deal with project structure. And we understand what the real world development is like. Mm. You know, a lot of knowledge generation within the bank. So that helps in, in that. And we have facilities. I talked about the, the Africa Secular Economy mm. Facility. We have the Africa Green Facility that allows us also to finance most of these projects, whether they're coming through climate change or they're coming through biodiversity or they're coming through industrialization. There are different ways in which we finance these uh, initiatives. Like um, it's been mentioned, uh, for us, we are not just looking at how much money is going out there. Mm. Our job is what is or what are the consequences of not uh, embarking on circular economy? What are the consequences on the continent? Africa's population, median age, 19.7 years, and the rate of population growth is enormous. Mm. If we don't do something about it, that's when we're going to see the dangers. And the narrative we've also put together up to this point has not been very helpful. Narrative of doom, narrative of gloom. If you don't do this, this is what will happen. Rather than exposing the opportunities mm. that are out there. So we've told ourselves circular economy should create opportunities for these young ones. And every project we finance, we screen it and ensure that it creates jobs. Not just ordinary jobs, jobs in green jobs. But when you look at green jobs, most people look at solar panels, mm. bulbs, and so on, electric cars. But we want to create jobs in the resilient space. Because if we say Africa is going to be resilient, we need to put people there. And then there are many others who don't want the jobs. They're entrepreneurs. But they are so small, they can't come to the bank to get loans or any of those facilities. Mm. So what we've done is we've created a challenge that allows the young ones to compete and get about a hundred thousand dollars with hmm. uh, business to business support, hand holding, incubation, everything that we need to take them from that nano scale where they are, cross the middle, the missing middle that we call them, and make them be able to uh, accept or access 
the SME funds, which they were. And we have wonderful, excellent initiatives that are coming up that we are funding in the circular economy space. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much. Just I'm, I'm looking at the monitor just on time. It was really, really, really nice to hear from you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both, Anthony and Karen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. so much to, to, to hear, right? And from sure. the collaboration that is happening and learning from the ground how they're managing these different types of risk to, to address this, but also how they are helping the entrepreneurs. Right? I, yeah, uh, and then also understand the regional differences, of course, that it's um, yeah, different in Africa. Yeah, yeah, but also the importance of, of seeing where they can find like common language and a common understanding of how, how to implement circular economy on the ground. Really nice uh, to hear from our guests. And uh, who is next, Mark? Yes, thanks. So, um, yeah, like I said, we are moving now to the to the next section. So we try to dive deeper into really what the action looks on the ground. We already heard some examples, but we have one specific example which we really will dive into now, and it is on the topic of uh, definitions, taxonomies, indicators. We heard that a couple of times already. And for that, I would like to invite um, Paula Perez, Director of Sustainable Business and MSMEs at the Inter-American Development Bank Group. Hi, Paula. Hi. Come sit here, here I guess. <laughs> Great. Um, so, Paula, welcome. You, I mean, we talked already about indicators and categorization and so on, but you have really shown some real action with the, with the IDB um, in categorizing circular investments in Colombia, I understood. So um, maybe you can give us a bit of an introduction on what you've done and what, what the problems were maybe that sure. you're tackling. Sure, and hello everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so maybe by way of background, the Inter-American Development Bank is uh, active in the Latin America and Caribbean region. And within the group, we have three windows uh, that we work with. We have the IDB, which works with the public side. We have IDB Lab, which is our innovation lab and invests in early stage entrepreneurship driving you know, innovative solutions. And then we have IDB Invest, which is where uh, I sit, and we work with the more established private sector. And um, we ended up working in Colombia on these because IDB Invest does not invest directly in MSMEs, in medium, small, uh, uh, and micro enterprises. We do it through domestic commercial banks, right? And what happened is that when we were trying to invest in circular economy directly, a lot of the ones that were knocking the door were the MSMEs. So obviously we had to work with the domestic uh, financial institutions to really unleash capital. And we looked at Colombia because Colombia is really a pioneer in the region uh, in terms of circular economy uh, agendas and policies. So they were the first ones in the region to create a national strategy for circular economy. And with that in mind, we joined hands with our colleagues from the public side who were also looking at how are we going to help the national bank implement this strategy and make it, uh, you know, operationalize it in terms of financing. So that it all came together and we worked, we ended up working with three banks and it was very much inspired, I have to say, by a Dutch experience of banks that came together as well uh, to, to define commonly what circular economy meant. So we had Bank Colombia and Banco de Bogota, which which are leading financial institutions in Colombia, along with Bancoldex, which is the National Development Bank. Um, and we worked, we engaged BASE, which is a consulting firm from, from Switzerland. Um, and this was a, a long-term project, I would say six, eight months, to really come together, define what was circular economy, and then do this categorization. So the categorization or taxonomy uh, is very much in line with the national strategy, right? That was very important for us to make sure that they were speaking the same language with the, with the policy. Um, but it, it didn't stop there, right? So we also looked at a very clear methodology. Once you have the categories, how are you going to go about it? So we looked at both positive and negative filters. Is it not circular economy? You know, put it somewhere else. Is it, is it within those categories of circular economy? Great. And what's Innovative here as well is we also put a filter on just transition, huh. right? So is, is it really helping people? Is it, is it keeping the needs of people in mind? Not just from a do no harm, but also from positive impacts as well. 
And then with those three banks, they each chose one example, and we piloted the methodology with, with all of them. Uh, and in addition to that, we added graduality to it. Because the, the reality is that in, in our countries, it's not about whether you're fully circular or not. It's how are you transitioning to a circular economy. Right? So we added some graduality to, to that so that each bank could have their own appetite of, of where they wanted to set their, their bar in that sense. We also uh, invited peer reviewers. So we had Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, UNFI, and others, and national institutions as well. And one of them was the Association of Banks. So the Association of Banks got very interested in what we were doing and then invited us to do workshops, eight workshops with 12 additional financial institutions that we shared this methodology with. I mean, amazing work. I think it's already also very important what you highlighted that uh, the public and private sector also have to work together. I mean, to really understand what is happening on the ground, you need to understand what the private banks do and that you that you uh, reach out to them and get them together. Um, so, but maybe, maybe one step back also. Why do you think in general is aligning on categorization so important within the financial sector? So, so I think many of my uh, pre the previous speakers alluded to that, but definitely the common language is critical, uh, both to have credibility and confidence from um, the banks. The domestic banks were interested, they knew something was happening, they knew the opportunity was there, but they didn't quite know how to go about it. Uh, you want to avoid greenwashing or impact washing, circular washing. Um, and with everyone setting up their own standards and deciding what's circular and what's not and how, when I, how am I going to measure it, that really creates uh, a lot of instability and, and lack of confidence. For us, mobilizing resources from uh, mainstream investors is also critical, right? So how am I going to bring a mainstream investor if I cannot even say with certainty, listen, I, I, I know what I'm doing and, and, and it's okay to, to join in. It goes down to you know everything else. How are you going to evaluate it? How are you going to understand the impact? Mm, and in that, the, the collaboration, as you said, it, it is really, really key. Uh, and, and leveraging the capacities. So that complement, which was not original, but that complement of the workshops with the financial institutions was really critical, because then we had something that everybody could talk uh, around the same standards or the same categories. Uh, but we didn't stop just with the sustainability people of these institutions. We invited the commercial and the risk yeah, staff in order for to get, a, again, the, the common language is common between whom? It's public mm -hmm. and private, is within the institution and is within your, the co-investors. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think, I mean, for the, for the businesses and enterprises, they also need to understand what the investors actually, what language do they speak, right? So more alignment there also helps them basically to know what kind of data they have to collect and so on. Um, I mean, amazing work. And actually, we have some first-hand insight how that was received. Um, here, uh, we got a short video from David Penagos. He's a circular economy lead at uh, Bank Colombia and was part of this project. And... Now the technical magic is happening, I hope. Mm -hmm. We can see... Hi everyone, I'm David Penagos and I lead the Circular Economy Strategy in Bank Colombia. For Bank Colombia, the circular economy is a fundamental pillar within our sustainability strategy. Promoting sustainable development to achieve the well-being of all is the purpose that guides our organization. In the circular economy, we see a fundamental lever to achieve it. One of the pillars of our circular economy strategy is financing the circular transition, the exercise we developed with the Inter-American Development Bank within the framework of the creation of the financing taxonomy for the circular economy allowed us to align our plans and teams with the Colombia circular economy strategy in order to add clarity to our goals and to take more accurate steps and to mobilize our company to a circular mindset. It was an exercise that did not stay on paper and that is in constantly evolving and generating very good results that we see materialized in the value offer that we deliver to our clients. Yeah, great. I mean, I think good to have a bit of an insight how it was received and it looks like it was, uh, it was a success and also great that Colombia is so spearheading basically on, on, on this work. Um, Again, I think it, what is important is that we also take some lessons away from this. I'm sure that you probably can give us some 
some recommendations or what we can learn from this exercise you've done so also other countries and financial sectors and the global financial sector can maybe advance this? Do you have some... Uh, and can they also maybe use sure. the categorization? Is that also an option? And sure. I mean, so, so the first one, maybe replicability. Um, it is uh, replicable, definitely. It's, uh, you know, it's not uh, very different from what we're seeing. I, th I think we aspire to then have um, a level playing field more globally, right? So that's why we're engaging with others, right? We can contribute what we've learned, but the idea is for all of us to come together and agree on something that is more globally accepted. But we can't get paralyzed either, right? If you don't have something, you have to start and, 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 and to take some steps forward. We are actually seeing interest from Peru right now to replicate these, uh, understanding obviously their own legislation. And what's really interesting, and it's one of the lessons, is um, in Peru, the main interest came from the microfinance institutions, which was a little bit surprising for us. But they definitely saw an opportunity for them to have an edge. Um, and, and in Colombia, what we also noticed is that for MSMEs to really take advantage of, of these opportunities, of new lines of credits or new mechanisms that happen, capacity building is also necessary. Right? So you're not going to be able to do it all alone just with the financing in place. Right? So having some level of advisory, working with chambers of commerce, working with the government, having the right incentives, yep. and having that dialogue with the public sector in terms of where to, you know, this is what I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing that virgin materials continue to be much more, that, that moving secondary materials is much more expensive because they have an extra tax because it's considered trash. All of these different things that they're going to start to see it as they evaluate these models, th those, are, those have to evolve. You have to continue that conversation. So um, I think that's one of the key takeaways there. Yeah, I mean, great takeaway. And is the categorization, can that also be used and uh, really by others or is it with more? It can definitely be used by others, and where it was very specific to the Colombian um, strategy, we mentioned it. We made a point of, of, of making it very explicit to say this is eligible within this category. It may not be eligible in other definitions. So we made a point, because we were thinking about replicability, to spell out those places where may have been much more specific to, to the Colombian legislation. It is in Spanish, <laughs> but <laughs> so it's replicable to that extent. But, but no, we, we, we're working on the, on the translation as well, and there's technology as well to do that Great. for us. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think it's, it's amazing to see uh, really how this collaboration within a financial sector can actually look like in action. And again, uh, definitions, uh, metrics, indicators, categorization is key. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank I think you. we're moving thank to the you. next Thanks session. Thanks so much. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Paula. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, again, we, we learned from the financial sector. We learned how the financial sector can work together. But now we want to look at the, an actual project, how that really looks like, right? Right, yeah. So we want to hear also what are the needs of those ones that lead the circular innovations on the ground. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to bring also some uh, voice from India. We are happy to have here an example from India. It's a company driving circular economy in multiple sectors, including e-waste, batteries, plastics, and glass. And uh, let me welcome on stage Pranshu Singhal, founder and managing director of Karasambam. Welcome, Pr Pranshu. Thank you for being here. Oh, yeah, fine. Yeah, we can choose. Thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, we are curious to hear how is actually the reality from your side and being very much involved in the practice of circular economy on the ground. Let's start with us. Tell us a bit what, is, uh, what does uh, your company do? What, is, sure. uh, what are you active in? Thank you. Thank you, Electra. So greetings, everyone. Karo uh, Sambhav is a Hindi word which translates to make it possible. That's the name of our organization. It was founded in 2017 to drive uh, circular thinking at a population scale. I would like to really emphasize the population scale word mm. here. So what we do at a grassroots level is create fundamental systems so that material circularity can happen. Now, what it means is essentially laying down physical collection systems mm -hmm. uh, at a grassroots level, which means working directly with retail, working directly with individuals, going to households mm. to collect products, uh, working with office complexes, enterprises who buy products. Now. 
why do we need to do this? Because municipalities essentially are you know, fairly focused on the household waste. Mm. And the bandwidth to collect complex products is not there. And uh, it is critical that we collect these materials and create incentives for people to participate. So that's the first thing that we do. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we do is once products are collected, then how do we recycle them? And uh, that's a big challenging space because quality recycling infrastructure is not yet present, at least in most emerging markets. And when I say quality, uh, uh, recycling infrastructure, I essentially mean, can the materials come back and can we reuse them to make a new product? So can I extract, let's say, plastics from a printer and can, can I make something, you know, which is of a similar variety, similar nature? Uh, the third body of work that Karosamov is trying to do is uh, connecting with companies and help them have a supply chain for secondary raw materials. Yeah. So, which again is a very challenging space because, uh, especially in electronics, uh, the manufacturing is not even in India, so the components come and then they are assembled. So uh, it becomes very complex after a, after a point in time and depends really on the material that we are talking. For glass, it is very easy. So we collect the material, we clean it up, bring it to a certain technical specification, goes to, 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 the, to the brand. Uh, but it's very challenging for electronics uh, in a similar way. Mm. The second part that we have been trying to do is what many speakers like Nicola, Karen, Anthony, they have all talked about is what is really circular economy and what is the framework? Uh, so in terms of defining and bringing what I call an industry status to circular economy, mm. which means these are the standards, these are the ways of working, this is how we should do it. Mm. You know, those very basic things of uh, enabling circular economy uh, at scale. And uh, one of the other things that, that has come across as very important is at any point in time, if a brand is going to utilize secondary raw materials, then they want to know what are the risks across the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you capture those risks? How do you understand the social risks of involving informal sector? There's a large talk globally on uh, inclusion of informal sector after formalizing but it has its own inherent risks. So how do you capture those risks? What are the environmental challenges in the whole supply chain? Because uh, it, is, it, it will be treated very similar to what a regular supply chain looks like. Uh, so for that, we have created our own tech platform mm. uh, by which we capture all the information in the supply chain, which allows then brands to know what is, what is really happening. So that is what we do. Wow, you're doing so many things. I mean, you're, you're, doing, you're having your hands, hands dirty dirty with the actual like uh, uh, collection and uh, recycling and also the repurposing of m secondary materials but you're also working in the space of uh, sharing knowledge and advancing the understanding and all the standards and framework development really yeah. good job uh, let's say uh, let's say uh, try to understand a little bit more for everyone also to lift it a bit um, what is unique in your ecosystem? Can we, can we get a better understanding of the challenges that might be sure. specific, the things that you encounter in your day-to-day -day practice in, in India? So the very first challenge, and uh, for me, when we talk of material circularity, it really starts from this place. How do you collect a product back? Once you have given it, you know, once a product has been sold, and now it's in hand of an individual or an enterprise, how you can't go and snatch that product. I mean, how do you encourage, inspire, enable people to participate in collection. And uh, in most emerging markets, the, the challenge is also people will not give it away for free. So unlike, unlike this place where you know, people will come, are coming forward and participating, our challenge is essentially, you know, at the, what's the price point at which you buy the product back so that, you know, so that the system functions? And who's going, then going to finance the system? So for me, the biggest challenge is how do you collect material back? Mm -hmm. And how do you create citizen engagement movement? How do you enable people to participate uh, in such a program? The second issue then comes, even if you collect, do you really have recycling possibilities? Think of a very simple thing like a USB drive, all of us use. Now, a USB drive has 10 to 12 different materials. Can we really extract those materials back and can we put them back in the economy? Very difficult task. So, uh, so quality recycling, how do we put that infrastructure? And then, you know, this particular session is really at the heart of, of the core issue. Who's going to finance it? If we look at the financing mechanisms, the biggest financing mechanism today is from um, using extended producer responsibility as a baseline policy principle. But uh, 
it is not giving the desired results, primarily because of lack of enforcement, mm. very thorough enforcement and surveillance. So how do you, you know, and in some ways, what we are seeing with EPR is, it is kicking a race to the bottom, you know, which means, uh, you know, it's a compliance cost, so how do I minimize my compliance mm -hmm. cost? And it is not triggering the thought of, uh, is it an opportunity mm -hmm. for innovation? Mm -hmm. So whenever we bring in the idea of compliance, it becomes a cost instead of an investment opportunity. And that is causing its own tensions in the system mm -hmm. with not enough finance being available mm -hmm. uh, to make it possible. Yeah, so you're saying that there is this gap of uh, having a putting attention to the, to the possibility and the innovation that, helps, that, that comes with the circularity instead of just keeping it as a small compliance cost and yeah. currently there it creates a, a gap. And indeed, you already touched, in, uh, touched on that uh, topic. This session is about uh, the financing and the question of money is central today. So can you share a bit more? Who is, how, is it, uh, how is this model designed? Who is currently paying for the collection? So if I look at what India is doing in uh, many of the South markets in Southeast Asia, the way they are designing systems, the full responsibility of collection recycling has been left to the brand. Uh, brand which is putting a product the on the market, so the producer. And uh, with government kind of believing in polluter pays principle that whosoever has put the product has to essentially finance the collection and recycling mm. of, the, of the whole system. Now, in such a space, it becomes very challenging for brand to really create a whole economy of, of collection mm. and really finance it. And uh, because it's compliance, as I said, that mindset kicks in and you know, who's going to really fund it. So that's where it's, it's stuck today. Uh, however, there are solutions. And uh, if I were to build on, you know, what some of the solutions which are emerging, for me the first is, uh, you know, a, a, a new scheme. Uh, I'm seeing it being trying in, ma in many countries now, uh, which is around waste compensation. Giving consumer, a buyer, a person of a choice, so that whenever they are buying a new product, they can pay for offsetting a previous product put on the market. So that's a very interesting model which is emerging. Another model which is being debated, but again, I haven't seen it being put into action is, can we really load the cost of circularity on the selling price of the product itself? Uh, almost all of our work, so it's very small numbers, less than a percentage point in most cases. So can we really load, you know, and ask a person, okay, pay for the costs of this product being circular. Uh, can it be done? The answer is yes. Have we seen that being done? The answer is no. Mm. And then uh, I think one of the other things that we are finding beyond finances, can we use the pathway of radical public disclosure? You know, how do we create a deterrence in the system uh, is, is important for EPR sort of frameworks to work. So can everything, every single data set be put on the public domain? Mm -hmm. So that there is a deterrence in terms of, are we putting in the right methodologies? Are we creating the right systems and so forth? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's interesting what you're bringing about the responsibility of, of the brands, but also the fact that currently certain policies are not um, being enforced so that the, there is a gap in, in the way uh, financing takes place. And um, it's also really interesting to hear uh, how, like we heard before about the national roadmaps and global roadmaps, but really to see how when we come to action, there are still challenges uh, that um, remain and uh, it's key to, to work with practitioners who understand the, the local context. Maybe I'll, let me add just one more point and it has been brought up very beautifully by the previous speakers. And that is around, you know, so there is a lot of dialogue around financing this space uh, because a lot of infrastructure is required, physical infrastructure to make collection, make recycling and then also re-engineering the materials. Uh, but the moment you are talking to financial institutions, what is missing is a common understanding on circular economy. So the taxonomy part, which has been debated, the standardization part. Mm. Uh, everyone has very different definition. And while it seems very interesting, mm. but do we see real action in terms of investment? The answer is people are still you know, taking a step back, still thinking, should I? It's risky. Uh, you know, so it's not very well understood. So a very important you know, thing which I'm at least seeing in this session is how do we come up with these very common business models? This is worth investing. This enables collection system. This enables recycling. Uh, because otherwise circularity is a concept and we really need to land it now. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah, thank you. And it's interesting also to, to reflect on what could be the role of the MDBs and the key financial institutions to to support this transition locally, working with uh, with local experts and practitioners that understand the, the details and the particularities of its context. And also, like potentially bridging this gap until the, um, the 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 regulations are in place to to keep an equal leveling field, it would be interesting to see that through the also the taxon. The only thing I think which I have to say here is, uh, while we talk of good compliance, but compliance is compliance. It does not enable the mindset of investment or you know opportunity creation. Right. So we have to find ways. How do we balance compliance versus the mindset of of you know, opportunity. opportunity. Uh, yeah, and said that. Uh, that is a magical thing to do if we can find that find that balance. That's a very interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed, to to shift the the language from just saying, okay, complying till here, this is my standard. To this is something I want to invest in as an opportunity. Yeah. Great. This with this, actually, I want to thank you, Pranshu, for thank being you. here, coming all the way from India. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Pranshu. Really great to have you. Thanks. Man. Thank you. And now, actually, Marvin, we are heading to our last part of the session and to a very special guest, right? Yes, indeed a special guest. And, and in fact, we know already from uh, our work that we launched at COP last year. That's the high-level roadmap that Nicola was also, touch also touching on in the, in the very beginning that we did with uh, multilateral development banks and under other international financial institutions. And yeah, we are extremely happy for the continued support. And she's actually now here to share with us a bit call to action and do some closing words. So please welcome with me the Minister for Environment of the Netherlands, Viviane Heine. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction here. <laughs> And uh, hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here uh, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you at the end of this important session. And I would also like to thank the people who organized this session uh, because it's very useful in my opinion. And it's great to come together to discuss the instrumental role that the financial sector has to play in our transition to a circular economy. At our last meeting, to, uh, that was at the COP27 in Egypt, we laid out a high-level roadmap for unlocking the potential of international financial institutions in the circular economy transition. And that was just seven months ago, so not that long ago. And during the past hour, we've been reminded once again that we can only accelerate circular economy with the involvement of the financial sector and how roadmaps enable action and what action on the ground looks like. The question now is, how do we move forward? I would like to share some thoughts and leave you with three key messages. First of all, actions speak louder than words. In the Netherlands, we've taken steps to position the financial sector as a catalyst for circularity. The Dutch Central Bank and I brought together key parties to discuss common grounds for moving forward. And this led to the roadmap, and I'm sure that many of you will find inspiration in the lessons learned in the Netherlands. And at the same time, we Dutch people like to talk a lot, so we like discussions and thinking things, th thinking things through together. But ultimately, you also have to put your money where your mouth is, as they say, and which also means that we need to start taking action. And specifically, we need to take action steps that we set out in our roadmap. Money has to flow towards bankable and scalable business models. Because in the Netherlands, at least, the problem is not that much finding money for uh, the um, uh, first experimental phase, but it's the scaling up where we really need to uh, have a bigger financial um, uh, impulses. And to put it very directly, uh, something the Dutch have talent for as well, I encourage you all to be bold and to challenge each other to act. And I think this is an important point for me personally because I see that uh, in the Netherlands we have a lot of companies and uh, I think also the government, uh, we want to be a front runner, but it also helps uh, to speak to peers. So also try, if you're uh, working for a bank, try to speak to colleagues from other banks and share your positive uh, experiences in investing in circular economy um, initiatives, for example. And uh, the same goes for people who are active in governments, please share uh, all the positive things that you can do with your colleagues. 
Number two, be the ambassador, that's what I'm actually saying now, uh, of the theme itself. So pollution, climate change and loss of biodiversity are problems that don't stop at national borders. And since transnational issues require transnational solutions, our international financial institutions must contribute also um, to finding them. So several multi uh, multilateral development banks have already come together and launched collaborations, and that's a major achievement already. The seed for that initiative was planted during the World Circular Economy Forum uh, and Climate that took place in the Netherlands in 2021. And I'm very proud that the Netherlands has embraced this initiative and is taking the lead to move it uh, forward. And I also urge other national governments and international organizations to step forward and give this initiative the support it really deserves. So then number three, and I can't say that often enough, the circular economy does not exist in isolation. It's not a new topic, and it's not a distraction from reaching the Paris climate goals. It's a fundamental tool for addressing global crises such as pollution, climate change, and loss of biodiversity, and doing that in a very integrated way. And if you ask me, the current geopolitical climate gives us even more reason to reevaluate the resilience of our value change. Chains. Uh, the financial sector holds a key that can unlock the circular transition. And I'd like to turn that key together with you to open the door and welcome a brighter future for coming generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Vivian Heine, the Minister for Environment of the Netherlands. Um, with these very powerful words, um, we would like to thank you for your attention. And we came a long way today. So we actually first learned why finance is important. We see that businesses on the ground, they need to get financed in order to circular businesses on the ground, need to get financed to really uh, move forward and drive the circular transition. We also understood that we need to collaborate globally. It's a global challenge that we are facing, so borders don't really matter. But we also need to understand locally what is happening. We need to talk to the to, to financial um, experts on the ground, we need to talk to the projects that are actually on the ground to understand regional differences and really tailor basically um, our actions to drive the circular transition. And how can we do this? Roadmaps can be a great tool for this. We saw and heard of uh, several roadmap initiatives. They can really help us to basically line out the next steps to, to set a goal um, in, in the future and to really move in the right direction. Um, yes. I think that's 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 the, my points from this uh, session, and yeah. I'm very happy to see all this very engaging uh, people on stage. It was Alexa. a great, uh, yeah, a great coming together. Uh, really nice to see all the different people bringing their passion and contribution in actual work. And uh, yeah, you said we, we heard about the why, why it's important, the how, how it happens with bringing different actors, uh, public, private, but also the, the different business stakeholders. But we also really heard with what happens with the action on the ground. We heard that from Africa, Colombia, the Netherlands and India. Uh, how it's important to engage with local players, to really acknowledge also the regional differences. So with this, we are all very happy uh, to, to have you. And also we want to thank actually our friends and partners who helped us to, to bring the session to life, European Investment Bank, GSZ and Prevent Waste Alliance. And we want to thank all of you and our guest speakers for being here in such an important topic. We hope you enjoy the rest of this uh, gathering of uh, like-minded people and the next days. We are very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.